You're getting signed out from the ED, and the patient is quite the mess. You hover over their labs and come across a sodium of 126. Oh no, should you correct it or not? Hyponatremia isn't going to be a common chief complaint, but it may well be the physician's chief complaint about a patient. The reason it's so annoying is because it's confusing from every angle. Mechanistically, it's weird. It can be caused by overhydration, but also by dehydration. And then there's SIADH with this lovely list of just about 5,000 possible causes. When we see hyponatremia, one of our first thoughts is SIADH. And I think it comes to mind so fast because among the causes of hyponatremia is the one with the most simple and direct mechanism. But SIADH is a diagnosis of exclusion, so unless you diligently go through the differentials, you can't really assign blame to it. Which brings us to the complicated part, which is the differential diagnosis of hyponatremia. People hate electrolyte disorders because the physiology is really complex, which makes the clinical pictures hard to understand and memorize. In general, the best approach in diagnostic reasoning is following a step-by-step -step protocol where you sequentially rule things out, but in hyponatremia, the flowchart is this monster here that couldn't even fit the screen in a minimally readable font size. And the other approach taught in the textbooks is dividing it into these abstract concepts and combining them like this, and this is clearly not easy to memorize. What I propose here is a different approach. Instead of using a purely clinical or a purely physiological approach, we can reorganize the causes and divide them into five groups with reasonably similar mechanisms. And you'll find that if you arrange them this way and go through them in this order, it's going to be pretty intuitive and easy to remember. The idea is, first you rule out the pseudo, then rule out the ones that are not really pseudo but kind of are, then the primary causes, then the hormonal causes, starting with the ones that you have to rule out and finishing with SIADH. I am defining pseudo-hyponatremia here as low sodium with a discordant osmolality, that is, either normal or high. Textbooks only call pseudo-hyponatremia when it's an artifact of the lab technique that happens in some of these situations, but honestly, I don't see a meaningful clinical relevance to this, and all this does is to make the subject even more complex. The classical picture here is hyperglycemia in diabetic ketoacidosis. The osmolality is actually usually high, because at very high levels, glucose acts as an osmotically active solute, and it causes the sensors in the body to try to lower the sodium to make up for it. Other than that, it also happens with high protein levels in multiple myeloma, super high triglycerides in some syndromes, and toxic alcohol intoxications, such as with methanol. Conveniently, there are four categories, one with carbohydrates, one with proteins, one with lipids, and one with alcohols. And as everyone who has ever been on a diet knows, these are the nutrients that have calories in them, so the way that I remember this list is with the word nutrients. For dilutional, there are three causes, heart failure, chronic kidney disease, and cirrhosis. The traditional name for this group is hypervolemic hyponatremia, or sometimes even more confusingly, hyponatremia with increased total sodium, which is honestly one of the most confusing terms I've ever come across. But that's why I said that they are kinda pseudo, because it's low sodium with high sodium. The actual pathophysiology isn't really edema directly causing dilution, but I think that using this word quickly makes you remember the clinical picture, so I think it's a useful tool. Thirdly, there are the causes that are primary, which means that they are directly caused by problems of intake of sodium or water. The first one is the most obvious, primary polydipsia, which literally means drinking a lot of water. There's no cat, it really is taking too much water in and diluting the blood. There are two other diagnoses that are kind of similar, beer potomania and tea and toast syndrome. In beer potomania, the person is an alcoholic and gets the bulk of his daily calories from his drinks and barely eats anything. Tea and toast syndrome is the elderly person with a very restricted diet and not much of an appetite that's getting by on just tea and toast for the most part. Since they are taking in at least some sodium, these are more chronic processes than primary polydipsia. Another cause that can be considered primary is diuretics because they directly cause you to pee out more sodium. Some people will have trouble making up for this and they get hyponatremic. And lastly, we have a less obvious cause, which is dehydration. If we just think about it at first glance, we expect dehydration to cause hypernatremia because it would concentrate the blood. 
And this can indeed happen, but this apparent contradiction is actually a matter of the timeline. When someone gets dehydrated, the body has a way to re-establish blood volume, which is by secreting ADH, which shuts off the gates in the kidneys and reabsorbs as much water as possible. Since the problems that cause acute dehydration usually make you lose both water and sodium, if you reabsorb a lot of water, you end up diluting the blood and causing hyponatremia. The fourth category is other hormones, meaning hypothyroidism and hypocortisolism. The way they cause hyponatremia is a bit complex, but what you need to remember is that if you're at the point when you're considering SIADH, order the tests for these conditions because you have to rule them out before saying it's SIADH. And finally, here we are. In a perfect world, to diagnose SIADH, all you'd have to do is to measure ADH and see if it's high. But the problem is that in a lot of the situations I mentioned before, ADH will be high because it's part of the compensatory mechanism for them. So you could never say that it's an inappropriate secretion. So the lab value itself doesn't really help you make the diagnosis. You really have to run the list and exclude everything else. And as I had said, SIADH has a million causes. Trying to memorize every one of them is pointless, but you should try to remember the main groups of causes, which are any brain injury, such as stroke, trauma, or infection, systemic derangements, such as pain, lung infection, and post-surgical state, ectopic ADH secretion by tumors, the classic one being small cell lung cancer, and a lot of meds, most importantly, anti-seizure and antidepressants. Okay, this is the approach to hyponatremia, but in some situations, you're still not going to be entirely sure of the etiology. For example, if someone's coming in with a chief complaint of vomiting and they have low sodium, are they hyponatremic because of the dehydration, or is vomiting a symptom of their hyponatremia that was being caused by something else? And this is where labs come in. The most useful tests are serum osmolality, serum sodium, urine osmolality, and urine sodium. To interpret these tests, I recommend you follow some flowchart, such as this one from UpToDate, which is very comprehensive but not everyone has access, or this one from these guidelines that is more condensed but is freely available. Okay, that was the hard part. Treatment is a lot simpler. The first priority in treatment is preventing the progression of cerebral edema if they have severe hyponatremia. And the second priority is not causing demyelination syndrome when you're correcting it. Severe hyponatremia is when it's causing cerebral edema, with the manifestations of increased intracranial pressure, depressed consciousness, seizures, and vomiting. The biggest concern is the edema progressing, causing a brain herniation, and killing the patient. To prevent that, you have to stop the progressive edema in patients with evidence of increased ICP. Just a modest increase in sodium is enough to halt the mechanism and prevent a herniation. The goal is to quickly correct around 5 mex using something like this microbolus approach. After that, you can hold the sodium in the same level for the remainder of the first 24 hours. The problem with correcting sodium too fast is the osmotic demyelination syndrome, also known as pontine myelinolysis. This is a brain lesion that causes irreversible neurological damage. The faster the correction, the bigger the risk, and it has been reported with correcting even just 9 milliequivalents in 24 hours so the safest route is to consider 8 as the upper boundary. In the initial phase, a lot of times the sodium can rise much higher than expected, especially if you also fixed the underlying issue that was causing the hyponatremia. To avoid these steep changes, you should measure the sodium very frequently, such as after every microbolus and then every 6 hours, so you can keep an eye on the sodium, and if it shoots too high, you can use D5 water to bring it back down to safe levels. Patients with severe hyponatremia need to be treated in a critical care setting, both because of the need to frequently draw labs and interpret them, but also because if the patient has cerebral edema that's causing obtundation or seizures, you need to monitor them for airway protection. Outside of this hustle that is severe hyponatremia, the main priority is to fix the underlying cause. By that alone, the sodium should start correcting itself. And for the cases that you can't revert the cause, such as CKD, or if you want to help the sodium go up faster, such as when a patient is having some mild symptoms, for example, you can use a combination of water restriction and increased solute intake. The actual numbers and doses aren't set in stone, but something around limiting fluids to 1 liter a day, adding oral sodium chloride around 10 grams a day, or urea around 15 grams a day, 
are reasonable starting points. When in doubt, refer to the protocols or consult a nephrologist. And lastly, I think it's worthwhile to talk a little bit about the pathophysiology of dehydration, because it helps understand the logic behind hyponatremia in general, and it's pretty interesting. As I said before, if dehydration happens acutely, the person initially gets hypovolemic, but the body reacts by making ADH, the kidneys suck in a lot of water, so the blood volume is repleted, but the sodium gets diluted. If dehydration continues on, such as if someone is in the desert, for example, or a more common clinical situation of someone who's bedridden and doesn't have ready access to water, their urine will already be maximally concentrated. So if they keep losing water, they end up effectively losing blood volume. The body maintains the blood pressure by means of vasoconstriction and sympathetic tone, but the continuous loss of water leads to developing hypernatremia. But let's not get into another electrolyte disorder right now, because I think that hyponatremia is more than enough for just one video. So a quick overview. Hyponatremia is blood with low concentration. The number one problem is causing cerebral edema, and when you try to correct it, you can run into the number two problem, which is losing control and causing demyelination syndrome. If you see someone with hyponatremia, think, are they having pseudo-hyponatremia? Remember the nutrients. Are they having dilutional hyponatremia? Think of the edematous causes. Are they drinking too much water, eating too little solutes, or are acutely dehydrated or using diuretics? If the answer is no to everything, order thyroid and adrenal hormones, and if they're okay, you can finally say it's SIADH. And that's it. I hope this simplified approach will make it a little easier for you when you're managing your patients and your exams. And stay tuned to learn more about mysterious and intriguing subjects that you wish were made more clear.